We were going to start our Revelation st study today, but obviously we're not going to. I'm not sure how long I can speak this morning. But last week I was talking about preparation that we need to be making every day to be ready when the time comes. And we were looking at Matthew 25. And as I was reading it and contemplating it, the Lord really brought attention to the lamps that the virgins were carrying. So I want for us to look at that a little more today. If you will turn with me to Matthew 25. I'd like for us to break down the words of Jesus here and Help us to understand the two separate places that people will be in and to make sure that you and I are in the right place. 25 verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, if we just look at that one sentence, they all have same goal. All ten have purpose. They're going out to meet the bridegroom. They know that the bridegroom is coming. When the bridegroom arrives, there is a huge wedding feast. So they're going out for that reason. From a parent, by looking at them, I doubt and can't tell anything about what they're Inside is like, you just see purpose of going out to meet the bridegroom. But Jesus tells us that there is a difference, that half is wise and half is foolish. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however took oil in jars along with their lamps. So I have a question for you this morning. What good is a lamp without oil? What can you do with an oilless lamp? What good Will a lamp do you without oil when you are in darkness? When you cannot see where you are going? I say that because the Bible tells us that God's word is a lamp. A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. However, Having the word and the word alone without the Holy Spirit is absolutely worthless. I'll say it again. Having the word without the Holy Spirit is of no value. None. None. We're seeing many people, and I'm talking about Christians, God's going to deal with those that don't know him. He's dealing with them in his own way. And there is a huge attention getter coming that we'll start talking about next week. That's for them. For you and I, we are the inner court. The Bible calls us the inner court, those that profess to know and love God. Profess. Now words alone don't mean a whole lot to God because we are not people of our word. We are not. We say things one minute and the next minute we're doing something different. We can say that we're studying the word. In fact, thousands of Christians study this every day or at least look at it Go to church, go to Bible studies, 
and without the Holy Spirit, they remain unchanged. Reading God's word alone will not change us. It is the power of the Spirit that brings the change. He alone brings fruit. That's why Galatians 5 says it's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience. You and I don't conjure that up. We can't just read it and get it. The Spirit gives it to those who desire it because they want change in their lives, because they recognize their emptiness. And so having oil means this with the Spirit of God, a life that will be ready. Remember last week I said that as we looked at the similarities between the people in the days of Noah and, and Jesus says it will be the same at the end time and that they knew nothing when they were totally informed, but yet they knew nothing. You and I don't want to go there not knowing anything. We don't want to just know the facts. We just don't want to know about the story, about the God in the story. We want to know him personally. It can't just be words on a page. Having a lamp only means only going through the motions in our life. I know that clearly because that used to be my life. Until I digested and got the Revelation story where it just cut the inside of my being open. I was one of these people going through the motions, going to church, going to prayer meeting, going to Bible study, walking through it, punching the clock, thinking I know all about this, so I am good. And it wasn't until God brought me to a place where I would be undone, where he would test me and try me, did I realize I was not just foolish, I was very foolish, very foolish, and very lost. And I didn't have an ark. You and I are going to have to have our own arcs to get through the flood of destruction that is coming upon us, dear ones. And that ark is your inner circle, your relationship with Jesus. That is all you and I are going to have. Will that be enough for you to get through? Because if you have that relationship, you will have the oil for your lamp, and it will be in abundant supply, and you will not be in darkness, and the Lord will light your path, and he will enable you to dispel the darkness around you. But for many people, they will be like these foolish virgins. Let's keep going. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. We certainly can relate to that. We've been expecting Jesus for a long time. Since we started studying and learning and doing time study and looking to see the hows and whens of what the Bible says, we've been waiting for Jesus a long time. When Alexa was four years old, she said that Jesus was a swopoke. Well, she's 20, one or two now, two. She's 22 now. It was a long time ago. We continue waiting. And yes, we get drowsy. And yes, the bridegroom is tearing. And it appears that he will appear at midnight when we do not expect him. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. The virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, 
our lamps are going out. No, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. First of all, when the call goes out, the wise virgins, the wise ones, they're not fearful. They wake up even though that they have fallen asleep. There is no fear. That call goes out and they're ready to go. No fear. There's no panic. And their dear friends that are with them, they cannot allow distraction. They cannot allow those around them to distract them from where they need to go. They cannot go and help them to get oil. They're not being rude. They're not being insensitive. They're not being unloving. The time when the call goes out is not the time to go looking for oil. It's not their job to, tell, to give them a Bible study at that time. It is time for them to trim their lamps and go because the time is now and they know that they must go now. The foolish are left unprepared. The Bible says, Jesus says, they've taken no oil. They were expecting someone else to light the way for them. Maybe expecting that the torch of their husband or their wife or their friend would be enough for them too. Maybe expecting to go in with their pastor or their friend or their grandma or their child, but instead they're left in the dark looking to see where they can get some oil. And then it's too late for while they're out looking for oil, the door is closed. While they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. When Jesus says, I tell you the truth, we better be paying attention. We better read it 10 times plus 10 more. I tell you the truth. I don't know you. The most dreadful words that you and I could hear from our Creator. I don't know you. Now, I imagine that they could have also said some other words. So put your finger, leave your finger here and go back just a few chapters to chapter 7. Now, I imagine when the door doesn't open, if you will allow me some creative license here, that the virgins not being able to get into the, the feast, knowing what that means, would panic, would be you know, saying more than just, wouldn't just accept that, that maybe they would say something like this. Verse 21. Actually, let's see. Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, and this is what maybe Jesus would hear, hopefully not from us, but Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? But Lord, look at all we've done for you. Look at what we did. We helped people that needed help. We gave Bible studies. I mean, they did more than we did. They've cast out demons and performed miracles. None of us have done that. And look what Jesus says to them. I never knew you. But then he adds another thing. Away from me, you evildoers. The things that they've just said, these grand things, Jesus calls it evil. Evil. The King, the King James says, doers of iniquity. Horrible words to hear for those that possessed no oil and they were unprepared. 
I was thinking about when Noah first started preaching the message, and I told you that 120 years back, that would be like about nine years for us. Well, just think if, if someone came into our church and said, nine years from now, Jesus is coming. Now, don't lie to me. Tell me what the first thought goes through your head is. We've got eight years. <laughs> then we can get serious. <laughs> How many people would say, Yep, next to you're crazy. Yeah, that would be first. But how many of us would be thinking, oh, good, it's not tomorrow. It's not even this year. It's nine years from now. I got a lot of time. I have time to do this. I got time to get married. Got time to get boyfriends. Got time to have kids. Got time to get this. Got time to do that. Oh, yeah, time. There's time. Imagine that how they felt in Noah's day after they got past the crazy, I mean, at first it's crazy, but what was it? if there's any reality to this, we have time. See, when we adopt that way of thinking, we are assuring ourselves we will have no oil. There is no such thing for us as conjuring up a relationship with God at the last minute. Now, I'm not saying that some won't. I'm saying for those that have rejected constantly, putting off, finding other things to take number one in their lives, we would not be able, we must not be foolish enough to think that we could just shove all that aside and say, Lord, I love you. Now I love you. Now I want you. Now I'm ready to submit. Now I'm ready to obey your law and be obedient to whatever you say. It'll be just like in Noah's day when those raindrops started falling out of the sky. It made a believer out of everybody. But the door was closed. When the foolish ones arrived, the door was closed. It is dangerous ground to think that we can put off until tomorrow, what the Spirit says to do today. See, evidence of oil in our lives, and I spent the better part of last year directing us to this place because it is a place that the flesh does not like, and it is a place that the devil will make sure we don't go to. And that is allowing the attitude of our hearts to be changed, allowing bitterness to go, not to be offended, to let that go. That is the biggest change that we can allow in our hearts. The biggest change is letting go of offense and allowing God to change us so that we are not easily offended. Because that grows such bitter root, takes over the soil of our heart where good seed cannot grow. Weeds will drown out. The good seed will eat it up, will take the nourishment that's there and grow deep, sturdy plants. Y'all try to pull weeds out. You know what I'm talking about. Not easy to get rid of. Getting rid of that, allowing the Spirit to teach us that, is having a flow of oil that the Spirit can use he takes our bitterness, he gives us the flow of the oil, and he turns us into balm for others. We are healed, and then he uses us for balm. And that kind of a submissive heart will do whatever God says. When the Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, you will say, today, Lord, right now, Lord, yes, I hear you. I will obey you now, today. That is allowing the oil. Oil is a lubrication so that there's not a rub. We all rub each other the wrong way. We're human beings. It happens. Don't pretend it doesn't. We get irritated easily. We get offended. We get frustrated. That's not other people's problem. That's our problem. When we have oil, we don't try to put the blame on our irritations, our offense on other people. We take it. Lord, show me. I'm sitting down. I'm being still. I want to know that you're God. 
I am not, and I've got to clean it up. But I can't clean it up. Can you teach me how to clean it up? I need change. Bring change, Lord. Give me change. Teach me. That's where we are. You're in this whole churning with God, being refined. You know what I'm talking about. You're there every day. That's where we have to be. That's where the oil comes from. And then we have those of us that have much oil know that we need more. If you don't have any, you don't know that you need it. If you're having much oil from the Spirit, if you are getting great joy from God cutting you down to nothing so he can build you up to greatness, you know what I'm talking about when God just takes us down and undoes us because when we see who we truly are, we're on the ground, ashes, deserving nothing. And then the Lord gives us everything and we're undone. It's like, wow, Lord, how, how wonderful are you? That's, that's the flow of oil in our life. It's reading this and taking it to heart and saying, yes. The danger of falling into foolish territory is thinking that doing good deeds but Lord, look at all we've done for you, thinking that that's enough. God doesn't need us to do anything for him. He wants us to be for him. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be righteous. He wants us to be loving. He wants us to be. When we are willing to be, then he tells us what he wants for us to do, and they go hand in hand. We can't just pick and choose, I'm going to do this for you, God, I'm going to do this for you, God, and think that we're having a relationship with God. We can't pick and choose what kind of grandness we want to do for God when we're not willing to be for God. The being comes first. The being comes in the inner circle. The being come in being transformed in the inner circle. Things that only Jesus knows about you. Things that you are on your knees in gratefulness for how he is changing your wickedness. Being so full of gratitude that he is changing your wickedness and replacing it with kindness and thoughtfulness and compassion and forgiveness and mercies for others and valuing other people. Those are the ones when the call goes out, they will be ready. They know the bridegroom. They have entered into a marriage covenant with him. And they are ready to go and nothing will slow them down. They are powered by the Spirit. Their feet will run because of the Spirit and they will get in the door and they will be in glory forever. And that is where I want to be. And I know that is where you want to be. And we must always make sure we have oil with us. We must never allow our oil to run out. And let me tell you how it runs out. The enemy is extremely, extremely brilliant. He wants to bring things to attention where he can affect our reasoning. He wants to affect our reasoning in the area of sin. He knows we are carnal. He knows that that part of our being is hostile toward God. Romans 8. That part of who we are has hostility toward God. That's why we need the oil. The devil wants to increase the authority and power of the flesh. He wants to increase the authority and the power of the flesh. The flesh being strong in its own. Don't tell me what to do. I'm going to choose how I'm going to obey God. I'm going to choose what I'm going to do. God, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do with this and in my life. I can handle it. The devil says, yes, you can handle it. You don't need God in this area in your life. Let him be busy with these other losers that can't handle anything. You can handle this. The devil wants to increase the power and authority of your flesh. The flesh does not want to be told what to do. Therefore, then we can't reason. 
Jesus says, come, let us reason. The book of Isaiah, come, let us reason. We need to talk about this, Letty. There's an issue here. I want to tell you where you are going to off the deep end. You have got to sit down, and I need you to change your attitude here. Come, let us reason. The devil says, ah, your attitude's not so bad. Look at all these other people. It's a lot worse. He weakens us in that department. And if we listen, if we're not allowing the oil to come, he will drain the oil from us when we start justifying what is bad and exchanging it. The other thing is that he wants to impair the tenderness of our conscience. The Holy Spirit uses his oil to keep our conscience tender so that when he speaks, we listen. We're burdened. We know we have to deal. The world wants to harden that. And we allow that hardening to come by allowing other things in our life to take precedence. You know, the things that we're taking in every day. I said this last week, what we watch, how much time we spend. It's called screen time these days. How much screen time are you having versus time in your lamp? You know, on the, whether it's on our phones, on our iPads, on the computers, at, you know, on our TVs, the big screen, what is coming in? We want to be able to input whatever we want, and then we expect a holy output. It doesn't work that way. We can't put unholiness in and expect God to have a holy output. Input, output. Input, trash. Output, trash. That's how it works. I don't know if I told you this last week, because I may have told several of you this, but we were on spring break. And this is not a big deal, but it's one of those things of how the reasoning and the tenderness. You know, movies are a big thing nowadays. They just are, whether it's TV or, or what we choose to go pay money to see and on the big screen. And there was a movie that I thought was a clean movie because I just, I rarely watch movies anymore because of the trash that's there. And the way that the ratings are set up, um, you know, some ratings are, um, movies are just made with just a little bit of bad language. Just a little bit. You know, we're just going to give license. If it has this rating, you can only have one very bad yucky word in it. Not a whole bunch, just one. Oh, well, one's not so bad, is it? I mean, you know, if you're in the grocery store, you might hear it. If you're walking down, if you're at a, at a college campus, you're definitely going to hear it. So what's the problem with just one on the screen? Hmm. Anyway, in my little tiny mind, I thought I had seen the re that the review was clean. So it was on pay-per-view. I said, hey, guys, this movie's on. We can watch it. Well, in the first five minutes... And a movie that did, it's a space movie that did not need to have any language in it. But in the first five minutes, okay. Well, girls, click. Because it's just not okay. We are not going to have entertainment and, you know, allow dirty input and expect a good output. A decision, you know... When you, come on nowadays, you're all together in one room, you plan to have this evening together, you have the popcorn ready, you know, you got the recliners packed up, you're in your jammies, it's just going to be a really nice family night. And I'm just saying, carry that into a thousand other things. When you go in expecting things to be clean and they're not, we have to make a decision, except that life is made out of thousands of these decisions where we say, we'll just make this excuse. We'll just this one time. I mean, four or five bad words, what's a big deal? And then tomorrow, there's four or five more. And then every day, there's more. And then pretty soon, your reasoning powers have been weakened and you're willing to tolerate things